Hi, I'm Julie levitt Learson at Fairfield University. Welcome to my video lecture on Roman fashion for our honor seminar, What We Leave Behind. Getting started, here we have a statue of a citizen of the Roman Republic in typical costume. Now, remember when I say costume, I don't mean like something that you wear for Halloween, but um, referring to a complete set of clothing. So this statue is called the Orator from about 100 BCE. It's a bronze statue of a Roman magistrate. I will mangle the name. Now, his name, I believe, is pronounced Aulus Metals. And uh, this statue was found in a pond in the late 19th century and now resides at the National Archaeological Museum in Florence, Italy. But you can see basically there are three parts to this uh, costume. Um, a tunica, a toga, and short boots. Here's a drawing of a tunica. And the word tunica is simply Latin for tunic, right? which is the basic T-shaped garment. In this case, this is a rectangle of fabric or two rectangles of fabric sewn together that are closed up along the sides and along the top edge with a slit or hole for the head to come through and the holes for the arms to go through. Sometimes you might have two small rectangles sewn on the um, outer edges uh, to make short sleeves, but that's not really necessary. So at bottom, it's a, it's a tiny little variation on that Greek keton. We've just closed up the top. Here is a 20th century reenactor showing us our best approximation of a Roman tunica so we can see what it looks like on a human form. So you can see this simple rectangle if you are wearing it just as is without any belting or anything to get in its way and without those extra rectangles, it's going to fall to about an inch or two below the kneecap. And with your arms outstretched, it's going to reach just to your elbows. And so when you do belt it at the waist and blouse it up a little bit, you can hike it up so that it falls about mid thigh. And that will make uh, some very practical um, wide short sleeves that fall just above the elbow. So this is a very practical, um, functional garment for all classes and activities. Um, for Roman men. So that doesn't mean there aren't a whole set of rules, and I'll try to go over a few of them, right? Generally speaking, this is an acceptable underlayer for upper class men, and it's always worn belted. You were considered effeminate if it was worn unbelted. And this was considered acceptable streetwear, as is for lower class men if it was belted. It could be made out of a variety of fabrics, typically linen or wool, but of different uh, quality of textile. Rome had access just naturally in Italy to sheep and to flax plants, so they could grow both locally, but they could also trade with the entire Mediterranean world and get just about any textile they wanted. Generally speaking, this comes knee length and then you hike it up shorter with your belt. You might wear it a little bit shorter in the front than in the back. Um, uh, soldiers and laborers might wear their shorter in general, so the whole rectangle might be a little bit shorter to make that um, easier to happen. And if you were, you know, a dandy, a, a fashionista of the Roman Empire, you might wear it slightly below the kneecap. And it can come in a variety of colors. This is a detail from a mosaic in a house called the Orpheus House, which is uh, located in Israel. And I think these two men are wrestling. Um, and as you can see, one of the guys has one arm slipped out from his tunica, which shows it wasn't completely sewn up along the top. Um, men engaged in physical labor might wear their tunica off one shoulder, which allows for greater ease of movement and harks back to that Grecian athletic garment, the um, existus. But for all its simplicity, the tunica can be used to convey some messages about your social class's status. And you do that by the decorative banding that appears on it. For example, just a plain single color white tunic called the tunica recta, that's your basic one. But then the tunica and justiclava has these thin red stripes running um, vertically down the, the front and back. Um, that's for magistrates and for knights. And then the tunica lataclavia with these wider red or purple bands would be for emperors or senators. And there are a variety of other ones as well.
But even slaves and servants wore tunica. This was just kind of the universal men's garment. Um, a slave could mean different things and their duties and their wealth and what they were able to wear and what their physical labor was varied from household to household and area to area. But if you were engaged in physical labor, you were going to adapt your clothing to the task. So you can see the slave here on the left hand side has like hiked his tunic up and tied it in front to get it out of his way while he's carrying heavy things around. On the right hand side here, we have a slave. He's pouring a big heavy um, amphora of wine. I'm guessing that's what that is, um, although it might be olive oil. Anyway, he's not wearing a tunic at all. He just has a loincloth draped around his midsection. And the word for that in Latin is the subligar. But this kind of undress would be reserved for the poorest and the most menial of tasks. The other real iconic garment of the Roman Empire and Republic is the Roman toga. I've placed the statue of our orator here against the statue of a Greek philosopher in his Hamatian because I want you to see there's similarity between these two garments, but obviously some differences. Um, so let's just look at the differences in these two statues right here, right? Our Roman in his toga has a tunica underneath it. Our Greek gentleman in the Hamatian is not wearing anything underneath. A Roman orator is wearing short boots. Our Greek philosopher is wearing sandals. And if you look closely, you can see that both of these garments, while they might be similarly shaped, if we took them off the body and laid them out on the ground, you know, probably big rectangles of fabric, they are draped a little bit differently. So as practical and as versatile and as kind of made for all classes as the tunica is, the toga is kind of its opposite. The toga is a long rectangle or oval shape of very, very fine wool that's draped around the body, but um, it's worn for formal occasions and kind of official business. It's, it's kind of like the Roman tuxedo in a way. Um, and it's cumbersome. It's probably uncomfortable to wear. It's not practical for any kind of physical exertion. And there's lots of writing from men in the Roman era complaining about how cumbersome and uncomfortable it is to wear the toga. Here's a drawing, contemporary drawing, that shows you how one might um, arrange the length and folds of the toga around yourself. So you see you've got the long tail coming over the left-hand shoulder. Then you bring it behind you hold it in your right hand, throw it up over your left shoulder again, let it fall down behind you in the back, then swoop it up around and drape it over your right forearm and hold it upright as you walk. We all got that. We're going to do that now, right? Like any kind of elite fancy garment, it's supposed to look elegant and effortless, and obviously it takes quite a bit of effort and manipulation and probably help from a servant, even though this guy is doing it by himself, to get it properly arranged. Here you can see some you know, 20th century drawings showing how the shape and draping of the toga changed slightly over roughly 200 years from Republic into Empire. And as you can see, over time, it's getting bigger and it's getting longer and it's getting more cumbersome. You can see that oval shape that is you know, next to each figure and how it gets uh, more and more complicatedly draped around the body. Until finally we reach, you know, the late empire and the piece of fabric that we're using to make this toga is 20 feet long and at its widest 12 feet wide. So, you know, three and a half times as long as a full grown man and two to two and a half times as wide. It is no longer a garment that has any pretension at all to practicality. No wonder those men complained. Again, there are several varieties of toga and how they are colored and decorated is going to depict and communicate where you are in the social strata. Um, I laid this out here in words because I think some of this is, is interesting and maybe important for you to know, right? The toga pura is just a plain toga of undyed wool. That's for any male 16 and older that's engaging in Roman citizenship business. 
If you are seeking office, like say to be a senator, you're going to wear the toga candida, which is a plain toga that has been bleached a pure white. And if you're wearing this pure bleached white toga, you're letting people know I'm running for office. That's like your bumper sticker. There's a great scene in uh, Shakespeare's Roman play Titus Andronicus where they're trying to get this Roman general Titus to basically run for emperor and they they try to hand him the toga candida for him to put on and he says no I'm not going to do it and he won't wear it there are other kinds of togas like if you're in mourning you could wear the toga pula which would be black or very dark colored um the toga prex texta it's a plain toga with a purple border so it's not very wide, but the whole edge of that oval is going to be in purple. And that's worn by high-ranking officials in the Roman Republic and then Empire uh, government, magistrates, consuls, senators. Right. So once, if you run for office as you're wearing the toga candida, then you receive the office. You add that purple border to it. This is a toga also worn by young sons and daughters, unmarried daughters of patrician families, right? Upper class, wealthy families. Then we have the toga picta, and that's going to be a toga that's purple all over with gold embroidery that's got kind of like imagery of um, battles or symbolism of valor. Um, and that was worn by emperors and by victorious generals to kind of show off their military prowess. And then um, for religious purposes, there's this kind of stripy multicolored toga called the toga, toga trabia, which was worn by augurs, which are like um, prophets or seers. I wanted to talk a little bit about wool and colors. So these are modern sheep, obviously, but sheep in Rome on the Italian peninsula and then elsewhere within the empire and their trading spheres, they come in a wide variety of colors, you know, from white to off-white all the way down to black with um, browns and grays and some reddish or goldish colors in between. So um, many colored sheep make many colored wool. So just by using the natural materials, you could have naturally a wide variety of textile color. Here you can see some contemporary yarn that has been dyed with ingredients available to the ancient Romans, would have come from plants or come from minerals. And you can see there's a wide array of colors available. Wool will take dye very well. It needs as a mordant uric acid that comes from urine, so it's not always a pleasant process, but it can get the color to stay in. So most of these natural dyes can come from plants, they can come from minerals, but purple comes from an animal. And a specific animal that it the purple dye comes from is this little sea creature, this mollusk um, that is found in the Mediterranean and it has a little um, ink sac that uh, secretes this purple liquid. Um, to get this, you've got to kill the mollusk, you've got to crush their shell, and then you've got to pull out that pigment secreting gland from the body of this little sea creature. And then you have to mash that sack up and let it dry in the sun for three days and then boil it with salt water which is about as stinky and gross and messy as you can imagine. Um, and the trick of it is that you need about 8,500 mollusks to make a single gram of the dye, which would be enough to dye the hem of one toga into that deep purple color. So purple dyed fabric, regardless of what the textile was, was more expensive pound for pound than gold which is why purple is the color of royalty and emperors. And probably why those senators' togas only have a purple edge instead of, you know, a 12 foot by 20 foot textile all dyed purple would be outrageously prohibitively expensive. Over here on the right, you can see um, two little samples of purple dyed, uh, I'm thinking that's wool. And this is actually like a discovery from 2021. This is purple dyed fabric and then um, wool that was just found um, in the Timna Valley in Israel, which dates back to the reign of the biblical King David, which is roughly 1000 BCE. So right before the founding of Rome. And now that you know how expensive and difficult and unpleasant it is to obtain this purple dye, I'm showing you the toga uh, prax dexta, 
um, for the senator here on the left. And then the toga picta, you can see the embroidered um, imageries of warriors there on the right, that cloak that's all purple with the gold embroidery. I always love learning new things. And here's something new that I learned about imperial togas. So now we're about 81 years um, into um, the common era, right? So a couple of statues of some emperors. This is Emperor Augustus on the right and Emperor Titus on the left. They're wearing those very complicated imperial togas. Um, Augustus has his over his head. That's a sign of humility. On the right hand, though, Titus, not looking humble at all, but he's got this thing called a sinus, which is when you've draped your fabric into a little pocket in the front to keep your secret valuables, I guess. And as I was saying before, right, this all is supposed to look, you know, effortless and what? I just woke up this way. It's fantastic. Even though it obviously takes a lot of effort to drape these togas properly. There are hidden in this statue, if you look carefully, there's a little detail there, these little tiny toga weights that are helping to make that toga drape and fall properly. And if you look on Titus's right shoulder, you get the sense that that sucker is pinned there. You can't see a big giant fibula like you could on the uh, Greek uh, ketons, but it looks like there's a hidden pin or two in there that's just kind of making that magic happen for that toga. And by the time we get to the late empire, we're now in the fourth century of the common era, they finally ditched the toga for a much more <laughs> comparatively practical garment uh, called the pallium, which is just a smaller rectangle of fabric that's draped around the shoulders and crossed in front and then belted to be held in place. And that tunica has changed as well. It's a long sleeved ankle length tunic that's gathered and belted and that has now replaced that shorter tunica. This longer garment is called the caracalla. So our tunica and toga has been replaced by a caracalla and a pallium. And I can't help but wonder, right, if the tunica and the toga are these kind of iconic symbols of Roman fashion, and we am replacing those with these two other garments that aren't quite the same as those original garments, is it any wonder that the Roman Empire falls in this century? Here's an image from a tomb of Ares, not the Greek war god Ares, but uh, someone who was probably named for him. And this is um, in the London Museum now. This is from about 160 to 180 in the Common Era, so into the empire. But it's two images of the same person, presumably Ares, who's buried within. And this is that Roman ideal of citizen sol soldier, and this idea that you climb through the ranks and you serve Rome in various capacities. So. On one side, we have him as uh, uh, a soldier in a very practical tunica and a cloak with some boots. And then on the right-hand side, he's in his formal wear, the tunica with a toga over it. So serving the state in both war and in government. But each of those things require slightly different uniforms. Here's a set of clothes made by contemporary reenactors um, that are as close as we think we can get to a Roman soldier's uniform. And so there are several kind of components I want to show you. First of all, there are pants, right? Unlike the Greeks who thought pants were for barbarians, Roman soldiers thought pants were pretty neat. Um, you know, especially if you're riding a horse as part of the Roman cavalry, you need something to cover your legs. Um, they have their tunica. Their tunica is red. It's got the stripes down the front of it, showing that they're servants of Rome. Um, this uh, fringed leather thing here on the left-hand side, that's the belt, the cingulum, um, that goes around the waist to hold that tunic in place. And then it's got that leather fringe that kind of serves as a little bit of protection. And then over that, they have this round cloak with a hood. You can see it opens down the center front with some um, buttons or clasps of some kind. And that's called the panula. They've got some socks um, and they have some lace-up boots that have hobnails in the bottom that kind of give you some traction and hold the shoe together. So this is a pretty typical outfit for um, foot soldier to kind of medium through the ranks. And then here are some soldiers 
um, from higher ranks, the Praetorian guards. These would be the emperor's personal uh, bodyguards and security force. And they're in their armor. So they're from the second century of the common era. Um, and so they've got the cuirass, which is the leather or metal breastplate. And look at the guy center from the left. He's got the, it looks like maybe it's an image of a gorgon on his um, breastplate, just like Athena from ancient Greece. They've got that cingulum there, that belt. Um, they've got the ankle boots, Caligula, Cal Caligae. Um, and um, I have no idea how to pronounce this. The terugs which is that fringe skirt um, over the tunica that's going to provide a little bit more um, protection to the lower abdomen and upper thighs. And then they have the gallia, the crested helmet on top. I wanted to talk about these boots here, right? The, the Latin word for boot is caligae. So you might've heard of the Roman emperor Caligula. That wasn't his given name. That wasn't the name his mother gave him. He was called Caligula because he used to hang out with his dad, who was um, emperor and general in the army. And um, he used to hang out with him and the soldiers used to call him Caligula, which is a, a little derivative, like pet name form of Caligae, which is the boots. So it's sort of like they were calling him Bootsy and the name stuck. Okay, here's our friend Aries again from that uh, that tomb um, bas relief. I wanted to point out his outerwear. There were several different kinds of of cloaks and outerwear that one could wear, and I just showed you that hooded military cloak, um, the penula, um, and you can see another vi version of that there on the right hand side. You can see the hood hanging down his back as he's walking away. But here on the left we have another um, cloak. I think this is called a laina. Um, and some of this military garb comes sort of back into the citizenry, right? Um, the lena is a circle that you kind of fold in half to make a semicircle, and then you throw it over your shoulders and you pin it to the shoulders on one side with a big fibula. So it's kind of similar to that Greek, um, um, the Greek cloak I was showing you before, the clamus. Um, but instead of a rectangle, it's a, cir a circle um, folded into a half circle. And then check around his legs. He's wearing putties. And that's just a long rectangular strip of fabric um, that you wrap around your legs like bandages. If you've seen World War I soldier uniforms, same idea. Here are some examples of footwear that are leather and kind of more for city folk, citizen type duties, um, things that you could wear to the market to do um, things around your home, things you might wear into the Senate. And then here are some examples of footwear for more kind of heavy duty, physical labor, uh, long journey type activities. You can see the caliga, right, which plural is caligae, um, uh, which is that thick soled sandal slash boot contraption for which Caligula got his name in the left-hand corner there, and there's the hobnailed sole of it. Beneath that, you've got the calque, which are the closed toe leather ankle boots. And then by the time we get to the third century CE, we're into some knee-length tall boots. Because remember, all roads might lead to Rome, but they might not be in the best condition. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about men's hairstyles. Now, these here are all examples from the early empire, you know, right from that transition from republic into empire into the first 100 years or 150 years of it. So on the left-hand side, we've got Augustus Caesar, who's the first de facto emperor of Rome. And then we have a couple of emperors that came uh, after him by a few uh, a few decades. And as you can see, the general style for men's hair is that it's relatively short, right, compared to the Greek uh, men's styles and definitely compared to some of the Egyptian hairstyles when they weren't shaving their heads. Um, they tend to be clean shaven, not a lot of facial hair here. Um, the short hair is brushed forward over the forehead and you can see the ears. Sometimes the hair is straight, sometimes it's curled. That could just be the natural curliness or straightness of the wearer's actual hair, or it might have been enhanced a little bit. Um, but these kinds of hairstyles, they, they thought they conveyed strength, thought they conveyed uh, youthfulness. Um, you'll notice no bald heads here. If men had thinning hair, uh, they would kind of disguise it a little bit with pads of hair, but also that laurel crown there that Augustus Caesar is wearing, that's a great way to hide some thinning hair. 
And moving a bit later into the empire, you can see here are some more emperors. We've got Nero, Hadrian, and Caracalla. Some of these guys are a little bit more infamous than famous, um, but they have a little bit longer hair. This is definitely curlier hair, and you can see they've got some facial hair here, but it's very neat and trim. Um, and and very well manicured. Facial hair kind of came in, came out, came back again uh, at different periods during the Roman era, but it was always kept pretty short and under control. And now let's move on and talk about women's wear. So I've got here, these are not primary sources. These are 20th century drawings of interpretations of Greek and Roman artwork. So take that with the grain of salt. But um, I've got a Roman matron here on the left-hand side, right? Matron meaning adult woman who has been married. And on the right-hand side, a Greek woman who is probably also a matron. And again, just like our men, you can see some similarities, but I'm assuming you can also see some differences here. Um, the Greek woman has two layers, her kiton and her hamatian, right? The kiton is the Doric kiton, and then her hamatian, and then her hair is up and in that um, uh, cloth hairband, keeping it in place. Over here on the left, our Roman matron, she's got three layers. She's got a tunica over which she's got a stola, over which she's got a pala. Some of this is Latin words for items that might have been, um, you know, translated from the Greek, um, but they kind of take on their own meaning. Now I have two more statues of some Roman women. This is the Empress Messalina with her son, and someone has colorized the statue so we can better see those three separate layers. And on the right-hand side, we have an unnamed Roman matron of the first or second century CE. So, okay, like Greek women with their Hamatian, the Roman pala can be draped up over the head to make a veil or head covering. Um, the stola length is going to be varied, but it's long. This one here appears to be about knee length, um, and the one on the right is ankle length. But you can see underneath the tunica on both of these women reaches the ankles. And that seems to be of a fine, um, delicate material, and maybe some of these other layers are a bit sturdier. Um, that tunica is high-necked. They seem to have some short sleeves there. Um, so it's more like that Doric tunic with the buttons along the top of the arm. And then over that, the stola is belted. These are belted high. They're belted right underneath the bosom instead of at the waist, like the um, piplos or the kitan would have been to make that blousey effect, right? This looks more like an empire-waisted gown. That Roman word, that Latin word for belt is a cingulum, right? It's a really thin cord, not a really thick, wide belt. And you can see they've got sandals on their feet. They've got their hair done up. Um, and these layers are kind of different thicknesses. Um, our matron here on the right, it looks a little bit more diaphanous. Um, lady on the left, maybe some of these layers are um, lighter than others. And I have here some details from um, Pompeii, a fresco and a mosaic, and then I have a statue, and then I have a 20th century drawing. So on the left-hand side here, you can see there's a stola, which almost looks exactly like a Greek keton, right? It's even got those two fibula at the shoulders. But the tunica underneath is long-sleeved, but it's so thin, it's almost transparent, right? And brightly colored, that kind of greenish, bluish color, and then that like almost pinky white color underneath. Um, and then you can see here this drawing on the right. It is a tube that's sewn down on that um, one unfinished edge. It's fastened at the shoulders with the two fibula, and those two pins make the neck hole and the arm holes, and then we belt it. So the Romans, again, showing how great a copier they are. Why fix something that isn't broken? Here's another fresco detail from Pompeii. Here, um, her pala has something called an institia which is this contrasting piece of fabric like in a band along the edge that could have been done um, just at the edge of the loom or it could have been added after the textile was woven. And sometimes you can see the pala, um, you might have this decorative fringe added again that could be done on the loom or it could be added afterwards. But the point is, 
lots of ways to decorate and uh, kind of express yourself through the little details. One little change that the Romans seem to have made from that Ionic Keton is that instead of little pins or buttons kind of tying that sleeve together along the top of the arm, they seem to have been knotting the fabric or, or sewing it together to make these little bumps, but not pinning. And then when we get to the third century CE, just like the men's uh, traditional garments changed, so did the women's. They call this a dalmatic tunica. Um, these are details from frescoes in the catacombs of Rome from the early 300s. And so you can see it's just, you know, a big um, kind of like tunica just taken to its extremes, down to the ankles, down to the wrists, voluminous sleeves. This is probably a, a true T-shaped garment because those sleeves have some pretty hefty volume on them. So either one long rectangle with a hole cut for the neck and then two little rectangles added on for sleeves or two big rectangles sewn together to make front and back and two smaller rectangles to make those sleeves. And those sleeves get to be so voluminous, the lady on the right hand side has kind of tied them um, back out of the way to allow for greater ease of movement. And you can see there are no belts on these. I don't think maybe belt on the third one underneath the breasts, but the middle one, certainly not. Um, hard to tell with that lady on the left hand side, but we're definitely about, you know, volume here and, and covering up more of the body, even than those earlier images. Which is not to say that women were never uncovered. Um, here are some undergarments or possibly sportswear. Um, just like the men's loincloth, this is called the subligar. And then the kind of bandeau top that's covering the bosom is a mammillare. So it looks like a bikini, right? Um, this is a detail from a mosaic about 325 CE from Sicily. And it's unclear if these are like special garments meant for sports, right? Because they're playing with a ball. Um, so are these, you know, athletes? Um, or if this is like underwear and they happen to be playing ball in their underwear, which conveys an entirely different message. It's quite likely we think that women did indeed wear items like these under their clothes just for comfort um, and ease. You can see the bandeau uh, top around the bosom is probably going to kind of flatten things as well as support. Um, Romans didn't really go in for large bosoms. And here are some women's uh, hairstyles from the early imperial era. So right around time of Caesar through um, the first few emperors. These are Roman matrons. These are high status women, including empresses. And they tended to wear their hair up and it would be in simple braids or coils um, or rolls. So you can see close to the head, nice and neat with a little bit of flair, um, but relatively simple. Well, fast forward 100 years, time goes on, and women's hairstyles become more elaborate and kind of gravity-defying. They become a lot uh, stiffer, a lot more kind of architectural, and a lot uh, more unnatural. So probably um, some hair pieces or um, pads that hair is rolled over to kind of enhance the amount of hair and to create these, these kind of gravity-defying shapes. And then obviously we're using some sort of coiling process here and other tools to shape the hair into these um, specific shapes. Here are some examples of jewelry. I'm showing you these because they're, you know, they're decorative, but also you can see here at the top, this is a Roman officer's ring with an inscription. I do not know what it says. It says something in Latin and probably a date. And then on the bottom right hand corner, there's a signet ring. So Jewelry, men were wearing jewelry, women were wearing jewelry, but it could be practical as well as decorative. Here's some more examples. Obviously, again, a lot of gold, gold with jewels. Um, they had access to a lot of different materials from all over their empire and could make use of it, so they did. I love this necklace here in the middle that is made with coins. <laughs> And then you can see here up on the top, there's gold and pearl earrings. The pearls were popular often in Rome. Um, I think of like Antony and Cleopatra, the Shakespeare play at one point, um, 
Cleopatra drops a pearl in the cup of wine. Um, and the idea was that the pearl would dissolve from the acid in the wine. And so she was so wealthy and so decadent, she could afford to dissolve gemstones into her beverages. It probably couldn't happen. The wine would have to be undrinkable to be that strong. Um, and what you'd end up with a very, is a very expensive bar carbonate of soda if that pearl actually dissolved. But it is an interesting symbol of her kind of decadence. Look down here on the left-hand side, there's a cameo pendant. So um, some Romans wore jewelry that carried images of each other or family members or the gods. Here's some examples of women who seem to be, you know, rather obviously made up. Not unlike the Egyptians, um, not quite clear if Greek women were big on makeup. But from what we can see here, it seems that Roman women preferred pale skin with some really defined dark brows and defined eyes, you know, eyeliner and um, eyelashes, and um, red lips. So we do know that Roman women did wear makeup and it had ingredients in it like white lead and coal, which is K-O-H-L, which is um, a black kind of sooty powder like what the Egyptians used to rim their eyes. They also used cochineal to make that red, and that comes from uh, the shell of a beetle that when you crush it up, it makes um, a pretty red cover color. Um, they also used perfumes and moisturizers on their skin, and Roman women sometimes bleached their hair blonde. Blonde was um, a fashionable color at different times during the Roman Empire, but... but um, Women living on the Italian peninsula and North Africa and around the Mediterranean, blonde doesn't tend to show up naturally um, very often in their families. So uh, if you could put some acid in your hair, like lemon juice, and then sit out in the sun and try to bleach it that way, some women did. I just wanted to note some of these images are coming from frescoes and mosaics from Pompeii. But on the right, these three portraits of women are coming from Egypt from the 2nd and 4th century CE. So these would be uh, from uh, funerary tombs, I think. And as you can see, there's something kind of distinctly Egyptian about these women, but also Roman. So as Rome colonizes and conquers places, they assimilate the people into the Roman culture and some of Rome robes off onto them and some of the conquered culture rubs off onto Rome. And for the last slide today, I wanted to show you some images of Roman children. Roman children wore miniature versions of things that adults around the war, but simpler. So children, both boys and girls, tended to wear tunica, and on special occasions, patrician children, both boys and girls, wore the toga praxtexta, that toga with the purple edge. Um, down here in the right-hand corner, this kind of beaten gold thing, this is called a bulla, and that is what boys used to wear around their necks. It would be gold if you could afford it, or leather if you couldn't, but it was an amulet with their name inscribed on it, which was for protection. And you can see in that little bar relief above him, there's a little boy with a bulla around his neck. So you can see, you know, they've got little boots on or they're barefoot and they've got, you know, below the knee length tunica um, with short sleeves. And it's only when they're older do they add the stola and pala or toga um, for formal occasions. You can see their hair is done. The girl's hair is up and back. The boy's hair is short like their dad's um, and kept out of the way. But these kids are able to kind of run around and play hard and do things that kids do, as you can see them doing in this bar relief here.